My name is Shani George. I'm a psychotherapist and founder of Culture Minds Therapy. My role is to take therapy outside of the office and to you all at home. I bring to you the mind behind your favourite guests. We speak about mental health, therapy and self-care. having me how are you feeling today i'm feeling great actually really on a, good on a scale of zero to ten ten being the happiest what number would you say you're at oh like most satisfied mm -hmm. a ten yeah a ten easy oh, yeah i love that what's easy. making you feel so happy satisfied oh man i mean well i mean satisfaction relationship especially relationship satisfaction is one of my favorite subjects uh but for me it's about measuring expectations with reality I think that's really what happiness is about. Mm -hmm. And as long as we feel as if we are on the journey to our expectation, then we are typically very happy. And that doesn't mean that you, I can't be in a bad mood and also be happy, because those two things can coexist, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a 10, I'm I an 11. That. Yes. Even I'm a 20, <laughs> I'm a 20, 20 out of 10. I yeah. love that, thank you. I was saying off camera that you're, you're very easy to talk to. And the Appreciate vibe that. here is lovely. So I just want the audience to know that the vibe here is lovely and you're a very nice person to speak to and I feel relaxed, which is I, nice. I, I appreciate that, but a lot of that has to do with you and, and it has to do with your crew. Thank you. And I think that's very important is that, you know, context sets everything. Mm -hmm. And the moment I walked in, everybody's smiling, everybody's pleasant, you know, professional setup, <laughs> <laughs> right? Thank you. you know, so so I think but context is is everything. So I know you gave me that credit, but it's because of what you have set up here. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much, I appreciate that. You got it, you got it. I wanna start off with Icebreaker. Okay. You may have not done this before, so right. let's see how it goes. <laughs> it's gonna be a wellness this or that, so kind of like a would you rather. Got you, got I don't you, Don't okay. even think too hard, just first thing that comes to your mind, just, just say it. Get it out, okay. All right, are you, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Morning runs or evening walks? Evening walks. Early riser or night owl? Early riser without question. Affirmations or vision boards? Affirmations all the time, every morning. <laughs> Bubble bath or hot stone massage? Hot stone massage because I've never done it. Okay, it is. <laughs> Spa day or nature retreat? Spa day, I hate nature. You hate nature? Oh my God, why? <laughs> Mosquitoes, <laughs> bugs, um, you know, I like to be inside. I'm an introvert too. Okay. I like to be inside. I like air conditioning, which oh, is what yeah. I don't like Super about cool. the UK. You know, <laughs> I like to be, you know, so, so yeah, inside. Okay. Yeah. Reading a book or watching a movie? Reading a book all the time. Meditation or mindfulness? Meditation. Energy drink or coffee? Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say energy drink, but really, it's coffee. I drink too much coffee, yeah. City breaks or adventures? So, but adventure could be this, all right, all right. I'm not thinking too, too, yeah, too much, too, but- Don't think too complex. But I'm, I'm about to overanalyze this thing, but city break, wait, give me an example. Like, Guys, you thought that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they did this. <laughs> they did it, not me. Because I feel like you could adventure in the city, you know, so. Okay, well, I would say for me, adventure is more like hiking, and city breaks more like in the city, busy, oh, shopping. City, 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 no city, hiking. City, no hiking. Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on. Hmm. Yeah. Plantain or plantain? Oh, can I say this? <laughs> you already know I'm Jamaican, right? Yes, I know. So there's only one correct answer on this one, and it would be plantain all day. I don't want to hear anything. I know there's probably someone who's not Jamaican in the room. That's the only answer. That's the only acceptable okay. answer. Okay, that's it. You heard it here. Paul said it. That's the only answer, right? That's, that's the only answer, really. <laughs> well, if, how, does, how was that? It was great. Good. It Thank was great. Yeah. I, I like those it. questions. Good. They, did, did you, they did all the questions? No, or? I did all of the questions. They done one. Well, we done, no, they done one. The one that I messed uh, up yeah, on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I like your questions. Okay. I did like their questions. But your questions were great. Thank you. Yeah. Do you know what? I wanted to kind of switch things up a bit and kind of make it a bit more fun, entertaining. So I thought, let me do this. And then, yeah, it's gone off really well because it's a nice icebreaker. It is. So. I, I like it. I like it. So are you introvert? You must be an introvert, though. What makes you say that? I think, I mean, um, I would say from your presence on social is, okay. yeah, because cause I'm definitely a stalker. <laughs> like, You've been stalking me? On, on, definitely. Okay. I had to. You know, it's one of these where if I'm going to come, you know, engage with someone, it's I like to know as much as I can about them. 
I think part of that is because I'm a researcher at heart, but then also because of my matchmaking agency, that's really what we did, is we would try to profile people based on all available information. But I don't know, I sense that, I feel like you're, you're an introvert. I don't know, you tell me. Maybe ambivert, no, introvert. You're right. I would say I'm an introvert, uh, but I'm trying to be a bit more extroverted just because of the industry I'm kind of getting in. But not too extrovert, but just a bit more comfortable with being me in certain environments that I'm not used to. Is this because you're going into media? Yeah. All right, I got to hit you with this. Okay. You, will, you might be, yeah. maybe you won't be shocked by this, okay. but most people that I've interacted with in front of the camera who are hosts, um, TV presenters, they're introverts. Okay. They're introverts. I feel good about that. Yes. So I'm on the right track. I'm going on the right track. You, you're going on the right track. And I say double down on the introversion. I, okay. Yeah, I say d double down on it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being an introvert in front of, mm. front of the camera. I, I am <clears throat> that, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, so hold on to that. Thank you. Hold on it's funny that. you said that because sometimes I feel like being an introvert, I need to be a bit more out, and many other people as well, not just me. We may feel that we need to be more out there. We need to show more of our life or, you know, talk more about this so that people can get to know us more. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who feels that way? Feels that way. But so that is slightly different though. You know, okay. so, so for example, you're an introvert, okay, but do you consider yourself somewhat shy? In certain environments, okay. I would say I can be a bit shy. Speaking of that, you know your Tinder event that you invited me to? Yes. I was shy there. So you know when you said, okay guys, it's, it's finished, let's network, yeah, let's talk. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, where do I go? It's a lot. <laughs> okay, so now I am an introvert, but I'm very confident. Yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. So there, you could have introversion and extroversion. So the way that I look at that is it's where you source your energy, right? So for example, before I came in here, to do this with you all, right? Mm -hmm. For me, being in solitude is good. You know what I mean? Yes. It's good. It's like, you were like, Paul, I'll get you 15. I was like, that's great. Yeah. I get a chance to just be by myself for 15 <laughs> minutes. This is good. An extrovert would need a group of people mm -hmm. to source their energy from, to draw their energy from before they would come into a room, right? All right. Then once you're in the room, so the introversion, extroversion is how you source your energy before you get into the space. Once you get into the space, it's the shyness or confidence, that's what takes over. And what I've noticed is that in, I, so I tend to go to places that I'm familiar with or to talk about subjects that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. So coming in here to talk about mental health, et cetera, I love the topic, so I'm going to be ultra confident about this. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we talked about something else, maybe I wouldn't show up as, as confident. So that's why I say the key is, you know, Hold on to your introversion or your extroversion. Okay. But try your best to become confident. And confidence comes through your experience and in you mastering the skills to show up in those experiences. Mm -hmm. That's where the confidence comes from. So, um, so yeah, so work on the confidence, hold on to the introversion. I love that, thank you. I feel like yeah. I'm getting my therapy now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do have a lot thank of questions. You, yeah. I mean, yeah. So you know what, as a therapist, away. can I? Yeah, so, yeah. so as a therapist, mm -hmm. how do you go to therapy yourself? No, I don't. And that's something I actually should do, yes. but I don't. I kind of feel like I, I become my own therapist. So if I'm feeling a certain way, let's say I'm anxious, I'll ask myself, okay, what are you anxious about? Is it a fact or is it an opinion? Do you have evidence? Is it a rational fear? Yes. I write it down. Yes. Okay, how can I challenge this? How can I reframe my thoughts? So I'm kind of giving myself therapy um, to help myself in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And if I'm feeling low, okay, what am I, you know, what's making me feel low? What can I do to get myself out of this low mood? Right. Do I need to go for a walk? Do I need to go for a run? Do right. I need to maybe, you know, um, eat something healthy to, you know, uplift me or help my gut? Um, do I need a hug? Yes. So yes. it's kind of like on one side, I'm trying to be my own therapist, but then I know that on the other side, it's like I actually do need therapy because I was even speaking to my mum about it and we mm. were talking a lot about my upbringing as a child. Interesting. And how Wait, it was was it that in the UK? Yeah, or in the UK. Okay. And how it was quite traumatic um, and how some of my memories, I, some of my childhood, I can't remember Interesting. because of the trauma. And it's like, yeah, we, we went quite deep into it. And then I started crying. 
And I was like, wow, yeah, maybe therapy is something that I actually do need because there's still some trauma there. Yes. And there's still some healing for me to do. Yes. Um, I feel like other areas I've been able to heal myself and kind of, not, not necessarily heal myself, but I've been able to kind of take my time, you know, process things yes. and then kind of take things one step at a time. But then there's other things where it's like, no, you, you can't be your therapist in this situation. You need a therapist. Yes, yes, to unpack that. You know what's so powerful about that is that was almost my same process where what I was trying to do is trying to, you know, trying to walk into, irra you know, we're emo when we're emotional, we're irrational, right? And so I was trying to rationalize all these things, especially on television, right, where I was assigning certain values, like um, on the, this one project, Married at First Sight, right, yeah. is... Okay. Um, in my earlier years, I was always assigning all of my value based on how many couples stay together, right? And when a couple didn't stay together, I would say, I'm, I'm terrible, <laughs> I suck, it's right? All it's all my fault. <laughs> and so I was connected emotionally to that. I was acting irrational around it, trying to rationalize it, and it was driving me mad, right? And that was part of going to, to therapy. Also, in that therapy, so this was relatively new, this is within the last four years, then all of a sudden, I'm now looking back at childhood, the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, my God, did that happen? And is that the reason why I show up the way that I show up today? And you know, so it, it just goes to show that I think all of us, what unites all of us as human beings is that we all have unresolved challenges mm -hmm. from not just our childhood, but our interactions with people mm -hmm. in our childhood. <clears throat> yeah. That's that's the key thing. It's like nothing was wrong with you. It, the challenge was in your relationship that you had with with people. And typically that relationship was with someone who was older, more mature than you, and they did something wrong to you, right? Their behavior was not healthy towards you. And then as a result, because you're a child, you know no better, and you see that as love, you see that as that's the way that people are supposed to operate. And of course, you embody some of that, and then you become an adult, and all of a sudden, it starts to, you know, to, 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 to show itself. Mm. But this is why it's so important for us all to do the work, mm. and the work begins with, with, with exactly what you were talking to your mom about. I love that. And one thing that comes to my mind now is that when I was younger, I always felt like I didn't have a voice because my voice was always shut down. Mm. So then when I think about what I'm doing now, I'm giving people their voice and I'm almost like, no, it's all about you. It's all about the guests. I want to hear more about them. And then sometimes my videographers, they will say to me, you know, share a bit more about you. But for me, because I, my voice was always shut down when I was younger, mm -hmm. it's like no one wants to hear my voice now. Mm. So I now need to learn, no, people do want to hear your voice. You do have something to say yes. and just embrace that. Yes, yes. And there's a reason why like, you're in this spot mm. because clearly you do. It's mm. like, think of how your life has all, all you know, conspired to get to this place where this is what you do now. You know, isn't that interesting mm. to go from a spot of not believing you have a voice to now a deep passion of yours is using that voice. Mm. I mean, that's that's a that's powerful. It's a powerful journey. I love that. We've had a we've had a. This has kind of been like a reverse from the interview that I had planned, but I love it because it's just different. Yeah, I mean, we're just flowing. Yeah. This, this is. I think <clears throat> what people want to see is we all want more authenticity. Like we're all searching for it. You know, even to parallel this to television. The number one pushback that I get on all the shows that I'm on is, oh, it's, it's too edited, you know, uh, oh, they were a cast member on a previous dating show, so they're not real. We want real, we want real, we want real. We're searching for authenticity because we know that we're surrounded by so much fake, mm -hmm. you know, so much fabrication, you know, so much bamboozlement, right? I'm going back to Malcolm <laughs> X, the movie, I loved it, right? You've been, right? So, so this is what we're surrounded by, so we're mm -hmm. thirsty for authenticity. And I think what happens with a lot of podcasts now, in particular, is that because there's so many podcasts, everyone is trying to figure out how to almost now script it like a television show or edit it like a television show. And because they think that's the model, that's what people want. But no, I, I, I think folks want what is, what is pure, 
and, and that's what you're, you're delivering. Like, your notes are here, you even picked them up. Yeah. That's, I think that's what people are, are hungry for, mm -hmm. you know, because they want that in their lives. I love that. What would you say to someone who may be struggling to be authentic or show their authentic self? Yeah, good question. One is to be around more authenticity, you know. I, I think when we want behavioral changes, one of the quickest way for a behavioral change is to surround yourself with people who exhibit that behavior, right? Because then when you are not exhibiting that behavior, that thing becomes unacceptable to the group, right? And we know because of group thinking, all these, you know, uh, essentially theories in psychology mm -hmm. that a group is very powerful, right? Very, very powerful. So, you know, and you see it all the time in everything, like even in television, you see most people who work behind the scenes in TV, they wear black. And you're like, okay, well, why you wear black? Well, it, it, and, and they'll say, oh, because if I'm standing in the background, I don't want to be seen. Well, no one really stands in the background. <laughs> and, like, nobody's standing in the background of this shot, you know yeah. what I mean? Because we can see the camera, so no one's going to stand in the back. But it's because it's become just a part of the culture, right? Mm. It becomes. So guarantee you've never gone to a set and seen somebody wearing colorful clothes, mm. right? Because it's just part of the culture. So we are, we are heavily influenced by the group. The group is so important to us. So when it comes to authenticity is you want to seek out people, people yeah. who are authentic. And if you can't physically surround yourself with those people, do it digitally like this, like you're real. Like I already know you're real, you know what I mean? So someone who's watching this, watching you, they're surrounding themselves with you. Mm -hmm. So get a lot of shards like in, you know, in your world. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, when you're thinking about authenticity, it really is about clarity with self as well. And that's why it's important to fully understand who you are, why it is that you show up the way that you do, and to embrace all of the differences in you. You know, I noticed this in particular in the UK versus, say, American culture, is that I feel like um, this isn't everyone, but this is a lot of folks is that I feel like the, I, a lot of the identity in the UK is how, like, I know how I'm different, but I'm gonna minimize how I'm different, mm. right? And I always push back and I say, look, all of the ways that you are different, trust me, when you add up all of those things, there is no one in the history of the world that's ever had the same set of experiences that you've had. Nobody has, that's why you have those differences. And the beauty of the world is that there will be no one that will ever walk this planet that'll have those same experiences. So that means that you are unique. You're unique beyond measure. And you're unique because of those things. So don't minimize those things. Put them on a pedestal, mm -hmm. right? That's part of embracing uniqueness. So you gotta walk your talk, surround yourself with people who are authentic, and then you're on the way. I love that, I love that. When you were growing up, what was your relationship like? I know you lived in Jamaica, you've lived in the US, and now you're in, living in the UK. Yes, that Turkey was shaped, in there too. And, and Turkey in there as well. Yeah. That must have shaped your culture and your narrative of yourself and your relationships. Absolutely. Um, family, culture, um, I am super curious. Mm -hmm. I think that's what came from those things. You know, when you go into a new environment or you have to go into meet a new set of friends or whatever it may be, you could look at it as everything I know, I know I'm good. Mm. Uh, like, especially when I lived in New York and we moved from New York to Virginia. And every, it seems like everybody in the world loves this, <laughs> loves New York, but also everybody in the US, they love New York. So if you are from New York, you're the God, like you're the OG. <laughs> So when I moved from New York to Virginia, everybody was like, oh, this kid's from New York. He's got like, everything I had on was great. Like, it's like everything, <laughs> like you're blessed, like New York, everything, you're blessed. They, you're blessed. <laughs> they love you. So um, I could have walked in like, yeah, I'm from New York. I'm good. I know everything. I don't need, but I walked in like, no, this is Virginia. Tell, teach me about this Confederate, like teach me about all this thing. So I'm super, super curious. I think that, my, my childhood and growing up, that is a trait that was embodied in me that's helped me out quite a bit. So, uh, so uh, I think the curiosity uh, and kindness also was part of 
uh, was, was, part of, was part of the thing because when I was, so I was born in Jamaica, Queens. And it was like, basically it was Jamaica, you know, where I was born. And then from there we moved to Long Island, New York. And it was all Italian. Oh. And so I went from basically <laughs> like home to all Italian in the 80s where you've got the mafia running crazy. So I'm getting hit, smacked, beat up on the bus. Like we were the only black family that lived in this neighborhood. And, you know, to, 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 for that to happen, I, I st the way that, and I think this is, this is good parenting, right, on the, on the behalf of my parents is, I still looked at them and felt bad for them. For the, du for the little but Italian that dudes that are roughing me up, I was like, I feel bad for you. Because you are doing this because you're ignorant. Mm -hmm. Like, are you doing this because you're just not as smart as me? Or you're, you're, you're doing this because you're unaware. So it was interesting. It was like curiosity, kindness. All of these things were, were they were nurtured. And then I, I, I feel like it, then it pops back up as an adult. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I had a great childhood. Mm -hmm. Like, that's great. Lo that's lovely to hear that, although you experienced some, some tra would you call it trauma? Or some difficulties along the way? Yeah, I, I would say difficulty. You know, um, I've seen people debate the definition of trauma. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Dr. Gabor um, Mate, who uh, actually, he's written one of my favorite books now, The Myth of Normal. Um, he defines, I like how he defines trauma. He says that trauma is an event that's happened that's reshaped you psychologically um, and, 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 and typically for the worse, right? So if, so, you know, I was beat up on the bus a bunch of times, if that had reshaped me so that now there's some type of trait characteristic that cognitively I now have, that, you know, that's negative, then that would be trauma. Okay. But I was just like, <laughs> you're stupid, you know what I mean? So, so, so that, that wasn't. Now, do I have trauma from childhood? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Was it that? No. I don't think so. What was it? Yeah, see, <laughs> that was a good point. You, you know, um, without going into too much detail. Yeah, I, w I would say that this, and this is something that I believe impacts almost all first and second generation immigrants, as well as a whole bunch of other people. And that is that your parents worked their asses off. They got to, the, to whatever country it was, and they were like, no, we're here to make a better life for you. You know, and so as a result, we are going to work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean in actuality? What that means is that they're not in mm -hmm. the household. And because they're not in the household, that means as a child, you know, you're thinking about attachment theory and how we attach, right? When you have a parent who is there when they can be, you know, so, you know, between um, seven and eight between my shifts and I'm home, I could be there for you. But the rest of the time, I'm at work, I'm sorry. I love you from a distance, right? But I'm, I'm at work, I'm sorry. You gotta deal with this person, this person. You could see how that presents what's called an avoidant, right? Um, attachment style. And this is something that I believe is baked into so many first and second generation immigrants. Um, that, that, I, that I meet, and it's because it was hot and cold. It was hot and cold, it was hot and cold. Like, we have to learn to self-soothe in one moment, and then the next moment, we're getting all the love in the world. And then that shows up when we're adults, and that shows up on, you, you know, how, how we interact. You know, even early on with my wife, I would notice that my wife is all about cuddles and all about this. And sometimes I'd be all about the cuddle. Sometimes it's like, come on, give me distance. And I blame, I say, I'm Jamaican, we don't touch. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but, but, but then the second that I would, be, so it's one of those where I see how it, it, it would just pop back up. But that's the reason why it's so important to go back to our earlier uh, conversation around doing the work. Mm. And the beginning of the work isn't even the healing, it's just the recognition. It's just the acknowledgement that this is a thing. Mm. Because when you acknowledge that this is a thing, it becomes conscious, right? So now, if I had no therapy, at least I know, okay, I have an avoidant, avoidant attachment style because of 
you know, what was happening, the love being hot and cold. I know I don't want my children to have an avoidant attachment style, so therefore I know I need to be more consistent in the love I give. Like, that's a very logical conclusion that everybody can make without any therapy. But it's the result of being aware. That's why awareness is so important. But I would say that that avoidance style is, is so interesting because it because I, I see how it, you know, how, how it's hit a lot of us. I love that. And I know you're very much, you talk a lot about attachment and in relationships as well. And I remember reading a book, I can't remember who the author was, but it's called Attach. Dr. Amira Levine. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. And for me, I did the questionnaire and I think I was a anxious, was it anxious? Anxious avoidant. Anxious avoidant. Yeah. And it was talking about you need to be with a secure, yes. someone who has a secure attachment. Yeah. And then it was talking also about your trigger, your, is it like your trigger warning signs? Yes. And when you get triggered and how to manage that? Yes. A really good book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you, you, you know what's so interesting about attachment? So this is the reason why I love empirical data. You know what I mean? I love research. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why I, I fixate on research because one of the biggest issues I think with relationships or even mental health in 2023 is that most people who are talking about these topics have not done any research on them. What they've done is they have read a blog post, mm -hmm. they've watched a 90 second reel on Instagram, and they form an opinion based on their experiences, and then they sing it to the masses. And if you have a massive following and you sing it to the masses, the masses love it, right? They love it, right? And, it's, and actually, going back to, to psychology, that's called the halo effect, mm. right? Yeah. You have a massive following, everyone thinks you're brilliant, Amazing. so therefore, but in actuality, when you start to unpack things and you look at the data behind it, you can understand why a lot of this, what we hear is garbage. Like a lot of it is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I, I love what you're talking about with, with attachment theory is because attachment theory has basically 70 years of research right now and a lot within the last 20 years. And we can pull out now based on attachment theory, how to relate to people. And that's why I say, let's go back to peer reviewed research. Yeah. Like, let's do that. There's enough of it now. Relationships were not researched to the same degree that say other things like cancer. Like cancer's got hundreds of yeah. years of research. But relationships now have been researched long enough where we can really pull some data and, and make ourselves better. Mm -hmm. You're bringing me back to my university days when I was studying psychology and research and qualitative <laughs> and quantitative. It was fun, like, wasn't it? Do you know what? <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. You didn't like I it? I didn't enjoy it. But now I appreciate it. In the role that I'm in now when I'm researching and getting to know people more and understanding the minds, I love it. Yes. So if I, was, if I did my degree now, then yeah, you love I would have got first. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but see, but you have that experience though, yeah. and you know how to research, you know how to, to even interpret research. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that, that's why we need more of you out here. There's a lot of uh, just talking heads, and that's not to, to slam folks. Everyone is entitled to their opinion, but this is a big reason why we have so many issues mm -hmm. today, because, There's not you enough know. professionals, there's more, like you said, the halo effect. If you can, you know, influence and inspire the masses, then people will believe you, but... Yeah how valid is the information you're sharing. Right, and then for us receiving that, we have to be more rigorous mm. with, with, with how we receive that. We can't just accept everything. Like now I always say, okay, you tell me something, okay, cite me the research. Like Refer really. Reference in Harvard. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> just reference it for yeah. me. And just reference it, like, do you read in a book? Do you read a magazine? Did you get it off of uh, TikTok, like just <laughs> reference it because let's start there. Like reference your stuff. Hundred percent. Yeah. Did you always want to be a, a relationship expert and matchmaker? No. What did you want to do before that? Real talk. I just wanted to be a billionaire <laughs> and uh, have lots of money. And I think that's what we all want. Yeah, but you know what? I don't want that now. <laughs> oh, you don't want that now? No. Okay. No. So what's changed? Uh, I've grown up. Hmm. You know what I mean. Um, I th I think so. I'll give the short answer of what's changed is another book, So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Okay. It is my top five book of all time. 
so good they can't ignore you by, by Cal Newport. He was a professor at my university at Georgetown in the States. And basically, this book says that what you want to do in life, what we all want in life is we should be after a different set of skills and where those skills intersect with our passion, once that happens, we'll make, we'll have so many skills, right? We'll be so good at the skills that the world can't ignore you. And when that happens, you will have more autonomy than ever before. So you'll have more control over your time than any other job you could have. Secondly is you'll make more impact on the world than anything else you could do. And third is you'll make more money mm -hmm. than anything else you could do. So you'll have money, impact, and control of your time. And I've reached the point just in the last probably five, six years, probably six years, where I feel like I've hit that. I feel like I've hit my zone, my zone of excellence. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just doubling down on the excellence. And as I double more down on the excellence, it's actually, the, the money is, is no, like, it's not a, a focus. It flows, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not like the goal of, I wanna have yeah. X, because you know what? Because I feel like my cup overrunneth right now. Like, I feel full, like, so I'm good there. Impact, and I, or, so let me go to autonomy. Autonomy, I feel like I've got control over my time. I do the projects I wanna do, I do this, I travel when I want to, pop up, do this. I've got the control over the, over the time. It's the impact now. That I'm focused on. That's the drive, is the impact. So do I want to be a billionaire? No. Would I like to impact a billion lives? Yes. I love that. Right? And there's an, another theory, right, from Paul Thiel, mm -hmm. who, who um, I'm sorry, uh, Peter Thiel, who is like the big financer behind eBay and PayPal and all those folks and Y Combinator. But his theory is that we make money in proportion to the amount of people that we impact. And it's an interesting theory. So that means that if you change the lives of a million people, you're probably a millionaire. If you change the lives of a billion people, you're probably a billionaire. But if you change the lives of a hundred people, then you probably got a hundred pounds in your pocket. You know what I mean? And, yeah, I love that. And, and, I like and that's that. it. And, and you could argue that one back and forth, but overall, it kind of makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Focus on the impact. Focus on, so first, and to get the impact, you gotta develop the skills. So you focus on developing skills, becoming world-class at a certain set of skills, becoming so good with those skills, you can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, you get the other things. You get the autonomy, you get the impact, and you get the money. I love that. I'm gonna use that, because I feel like I'm in that space where doing these interviews, I love it. I won't change it for the absolute world. I've invested, we've invested so much into it. Yeah. And I can I see, I can see these team. cameras. These are real cameras. I can see it. I always tell them, <laughs> I said, we're a team now. It's not I anymore. It's we, and yes. we're going to innovate and we're going to achieve so, so much. Yes. We're going to impact so many people. We're going to encourage people to go to therapy, to talk about mental health. So I, I'm going to use that analogy that you mentioned. Can I give you another maybe boost of, of, of inspiration on this? Yeah. This is Please something this is something that I like, and this is actually for you guys here too. Okay. This is this is so I'm really I'm not talking to y'all anymore on the camera. I'm talking to, <laughs> to the folks in the room. So I, I, I'm saying this. It's always not great to talk about another podcast, but I have to do this, mm -hmm. right? So Stephen Bartlett and his team at Diary of a CEO are hands down the sharpest, most brilliant, most high executing media team I've ever seen. And I'm talking about, I've been in some big television productions, but they are on a whole nother level. But there was one question that I asked him at the end of uh, my interview with him, and his response allowed me to understand why they're so excellent. So here we were, it, he's got this incredible studio, multiple camera, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, yo, <laughs> why don't you do more podcasts? Like, you're hardly in here because you're running 15 other businesses. You should do other podcasts. He said, no, every moment that we would spend on another podcast is a moment that we're not spending on our craft, perfecting what we're doing. So in essence, what he was saying was exactly what Cal Newport was saying, is, is, that, is, is that focus on your craft, focus on what you do. The better you are at that, the more impact you make, the more all of this other stuff happens. 
they've got that concept and that's what they do. They're fixated on, on raising the bar of excellence in everything they do, everything they do. And I think that that was, when I, when I heard that, it was motivation for me. It was inspiration, uh, you know, to double down even more. Mm, I, love, I love that and I love Stephen. I think what Stephen's doing is incredible and I'm hoping to get a seat. What did you say? You there? Yeah, no. Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah. incredible. Shout yeah. out to Stephen Barlett. Definitely. He's, he's, doing, the, he's doing amazing things, definitely. amazing guests. And I like his questioning style as well. Yes. He's, yeah. Top notch. Yeah, he is. He, d he does it right. Last question. Okay. How do you take care of your mental health, Paul? Oh, my God. We need an hour for that. <laughs> we need an hour for that. I mean, um, all right, I'll give you a try to do a quick okay. day run. Yes. Is... Every morning when I wake up, I do the same thing. I have the same routine. Okay. The first thing I do is I think about at least three things from, that happened the previous day that, I'm, that I have gratitude for, that I'm thankful for. And it could range from, you know, my aunt's out of the hospital to yesterday uh, my son got selected to give a big speech at opening day with the headmaster, right? So it could range, right? Or it could be, you know, Thank goodness the media didn't really come after me on the TV show that I did. Like, whatever it may be, but three things that I'm thankful. So, boom, I pop up, I'm thankful. Second is I make sure I don't touch my phone for at least 15 minutes because of the blue light, the white lights, all that stuff, right? So that's one. Uh, third is I normally give my wife a kiss or sometimes I do other things. Uh, <laughs> then uh, I work out. So I go work out. I pop a Huel. Shout out to Steven again. He got me addicted to these Huels. Uh, but I work out for about an hour, uh, and then sometimes at the end I'll do some meditation at the end of that. Uh, I'll take a long hot shower. I know you're supposed to do cold showers. I take hot, uh, right? So the first part of the day is all, oh yeah, and I drop a whole lot of CBD. Oh, okay. I'm heavy on CBD. Yeah, yeah. heavy on CBD. So, uh, and I experiment with lots of different versions. So all of that is the morning, mm. and then I have lots of stuff during the day. But the number one thing I do is I stay away from fools. You stay away from? Fools. What's <laughs> you say? <laughs> you say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's, that's the number one thing. I'm serious. That's the number one thing. If, I, if, 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 if I think you're a fool, <laughs> I, 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 I hit the other way. I don't engage. <laughs> And the moment I that, that I recognize somebody's a fool, I just stop talking to them. <laughs> For real. And you ever see me, even on television, sometimes I'm talking to somebody, I'm talking to them, da, da, da. I'm like, oh, damn, he's a fool. <laughs> and Did I just stop clear? talking. <laughs> yeah. The producer's in my ear. Paul, you forgot to ask a question. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't forget to ask a question. I'm just not talking. I'm not talking to him. <laughs> I'm not going to engage. I've committed that I have a full bar. <laughs> If you pass the fool, but like if you are a fool yeah. and you're born, I'm not engaging. It's wasted energy. It's wasted energy. But when you engage with someone who's not, mm -hmm. like look at this, I'm bouncing energy to you. You're throwing it right back to me. It's boosting me up. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> this, this is how exchanges, this is how, li this is life. Mm. If I'm a fool, you can throw me your energy. I'm just going to suck it up. Mm. <laughs> you know? So yeah, so I'll stay I away from that. fools. I love that so much. Thank you so much for coming. We thank need you. to do a part two because I've still got more questions. We should do a part two. But thank you so much. I loved having you on. It was an honor. It was a pleasure. It was a privilege. Thank I appreciate you. you. I appreciate what you do. Thank I you. appreciate your team. Thank really, you. I think you guys are like, I, I think you're on to something very special. Amen. Yes.